order to electronics, you have to. On behalf of uh, Jonathan and Mara, the uh, Beasley family, the Grant family, we, we welcome each of you here on this uh, very, very uh, special occasion. It's one that's, that we've all looked forward to really for many months uh, now. And I want to congratulate Jonathan and Omara for having an honorable courtship, one that has been a very fine example to uh, anyone who is anticipating a marriage. It's a very important step that one takes in their life, and I'm certain that throughout this courtship period, uh, when the two of you expressed to others that you were getting married, well, I'm sure everyone gave you advice. And everyone did that out of an interest in seeing your marriage succeed. And so we want to thank everyone who played a part in the courtship, the successful courtship that the two of you have enjoyed over these months. But we all want the same thing. We all want to see a successful courtship become a successful marriage. And so one would then ask, how might we be able to do that? How can that be accomplished? Well, I'm going to give you a visual image of something that I am hoping you'll reflect on, especially as you get to know each other and begin to understand exactly what it means to be married. And so here's the image. I think it's here in my pocket. And it's this. It's a key ring. And I thought about this because just about every important milestone in our life that one has, there seems to be a key associated with it. You know, for example, when you reach the age of some level of responsibility, what do you receive? You receive a key, and probably the key to a door, a key to your home. Later in life, uh, when you prove to be even more responsible, why you're given another key. Maybe it's the key to an automobile. And what do you do? You use those keys, you take them seriously, they become important. And I thought about that when I considered my own keys. And these are my keys. <laughs> the keys are the keys add up, don't they? And I'm certain that if uh, you reach into your pocket or into your purse, you're gonna pull out a big uh, key ring with a lot of keys on it but you understand what each of those keys represent. They may all look alike, and yet you know exactly what those keys represent. And uh, you also know that once you use the key, well, it leads you to something. It leads you to whatever it is you're searching for, whatever purpose you might have for going beyond that door or using it in a lock, whatever the case might be. And so, in a symbolic sense, we're here to give you another set of keys that will go on your symbolic key ring. And you're not going to receive a lot of keys. You're not going to walk away with a big wad of keys. But instead, you're going to have just two keys. And if you use those two keys successfully, you will enjoy a successful marriage. So what is the first key that might be given to you that would lead to your success as husband and wife? Well, the obvious answer is the first key, and the obvious answer is love. Love is very, very important, and it's the first key that is necessary for you to enjoy marriage, and you want to use that key in a way that is going to be honorable. Well, when you think in terms of love, one might think, in terms of you know a combination of you know different types of love because there are different loves that um, one might have for example one has a very warm and personal affection for someone the kind of love that exists between close friends 
So any one of us has been able to enjoy that kind of love, but we might have a very close and warm friendship. Another is the love that grows between family members. When you say that you love someone, a brother, a sister, a cousin, a father, etc., well, the person hearing you knows exactly what that means. A third is the romantic love that one can have for a member of the opposite sex. And so those are three loves we all relate to, we've all experienced, and really, the two of you have gone through that in your relationship. Because the way that I understand the Jonathan and Omara story is that you were friends first. And that friendship uh, evolved into something very special and is one of the reasons that the two of you are here today. However, the fourth love is the love that's really the key to your marriage. And that fourth love is agape love. And it's the one that the Bible describes a number of times and is closely associated with our God and Father Jehovah. It is a perfect love, and it is a principled love. We find in a number of places in the Bible the word agape is used in association with love. For example, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, we read uh, love, this expression of love, as it says here, go on walking in love, just as the Christ also loved you and delivered himself up for you. And in John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus used the word love to describe the special relationship that his followers would have for each other. When he said in John 13, 35, by this all will know that you are my disciples. If you have love, agape love, among yourselves. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 13, again the use of agape, there remains faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is agape, love. So this love is very important, very special, one that has to be cultivated in your marriage. But now, what makes this love so special? In fact, when you reflect on what 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, there remain faith, hope, love, these three. Well, what makes agape love greater than faith and hope? And it's the fact that it's governed by principles, right principles that are found in God's Word. So, going back to this image of a key ring, you might uh, imagine the key ring being Bible principles. And you're taking that very first key that represents love, agape love, and you're placing it on the key ring. And you're allowing Bible principles to guide your life. Because agape love is an unselfish concern for doing to others what is right and good from God's standpoint whether the recipient appears to deserve it or not. Now, that's an interesting description of what agape love is, but this type of love, Jonathan and Omar, enables marriage partners to follow the Bible's counsel. And when you think about that, that will become more and more important as you begin your marriage, as you enjoy life as husband and wife. Because... Uh, one Bible principle or one Bible counsel uh, in particular, Colossians chapter 3, verse 13 reads, Continue putting up with one another and forgiving one another freely if anyone has a cause for complaint against another, even as Jehovah freely forgave you, so do you also. So you can just imagine 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 3, verse 13 really, you know, be kind of an overarching uh, counsel that's going to be a part of your relationship. This idea of putting up with one another, forgiving one another freely, if anyone has cause for complaint. Because we're allowing Jehovah God to guide whatever decisions, whatever actions, whatever it is that we do in our marriage. And then finally, one of the things that makes love so powerful is what we read in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8 because there it says love 
a multitude of sins. So, reflecting on what that says, we're helped to appreciate that love is going to do what? It's going to cover mistakes, isn't it? It's not going to eliminate it. You're both imperfect. You're going to make mistakes. But it says love covers it. And we want to follow the example of Jehovah God when it comes to overlooking mistakes that are going to be made. And this may, you might think, well, in the beginning of our marriage, yeah, we're both going to make mistakes. No, it's going to happen throughout your marriage. <laughs> There's going to be mistakes. You can't hope it. You're, you're imperfect. So we want to be like Jehovah God when it comes to, you know, if, if the mistake is something that might affect the other, we certainly want to be like Jehovah God in overlooking any mistakes that the other person makes. One of my favorite Bible verses is one that I'd like to ask the two of you to find in your Bible. And it's a psalm, the 130th Psalm, verse 3 and 4. Psalm 130, 3 and 4. And here it reads, If errors are what you watch, O Jah, then who, O Jehovah, could stand? For with you there is true forgiveness, so that you may be held in awe. So, if you're imitating Jehovah God when it comes to allowing your love to cover a multitude of sins or covering mistakes that the two of you are certain to make, we want to follow the example of Jehovah. Jehovah God overlooks those mistakes. And instead, he is motivated by true forgiveness. And this is what the two of you would certainly want to work toward in your relationship. And so when you do uh, something such as this, well, you can imagine the effect it's going to have on your relationship. When you know that uh, the other is willing and ready to forgive, then it makes it a lot easier for you because you're going to have those issues that will arise from time to time. Well, now, the question is, how do you do this? How do you cultivate the kind of love that Jehovah God has? It's very simple. Imitate the example of Jesus. We study his example. And uh, for every married couple today, whether you're newly married or been married for a number of years, we have so many resources that um, will help us to imitate the example that Jesus set for us because uh, we have the Bible that we can read. And there's so many publications available that detail the life of Jesus and how he handled virtually every type of possible situation. And nowhere in any of the situations described in the Bible were we shocked by Jesus' behavior that he did something that was unbecoming or inappropriate. But instead, um, he always said he always did the right thing. So if the two of you, as a first step, study the example of Jesus and try to imitate him and try to think and act like him, that will go a long way toward the success that you will enjoy in your marriage. In addition, attend congregation meetings on a regular basis because we find there God's word is taught. We're able to learn more on how we can apply Bible principles in our life. And a very important element is prayer. Pray to Jehovah God for help to develop this elevated kind of love, which is a fruit of God's Holy Spirit. So we have a key that has been uh, added to your ring. That ring being Bible principles, the very first key is that of love. Well, what do you think the second one is? Well, the second one is also a very important quality, one that anyone can cultivate, but it's especially important in marriage, and that is respect. Now, oftentimes when we think about marriage, we always, you know, mention this thing about, well, you know, the wife should respect the husband, but it works both ways. The husband should also respect the wife. When we think in terms of the definition for respect, we probably can come up with a number of um, you know, adjectives associated with respect. However, when we consider 
you know, the general definition of respect, it has to do with giving consideration to others and honoring them. Giving consideration to others and honoring them. Well, have you ever had that experience where you felt that you were receiving special attention? Somehow you were being honored by someone else, maybe because of something that you did or nothing that you did, and yet they made you feel, feel very special. Well, that's what respect is. A person respects you uh, perhaps because they know something about you or it's part of who they are. They know it's important to respect the other person. Well, that's especially important for a married couple. Now, what Bible principle might help us to uh, develop the kind of uh, respect that is so necessary in marriage? I want you to find another Bible verse, Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. This is fine counsel here for all Christians, but especially husbands and wives. And that counsel reads, in showing honor to one another, take the lead. Now think about what that means. You're not waiting for a cue from the other person to decide whether you should respect them. But that becomes part of your makeup, that becomes part of the fabric of your marriage. Both parties know that one respects the other. Very, very important. And of course, we do have the counsel that applies to husbands in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. You husbands continue dwelling in like manner with your wives according to knowledge, assigning them honor as to a weaker vessel, the feminine one. But then the wife in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33 is counseled to have deep respect for her husband. So the quality of respect. The key of respect that is so important in marriage is based on the Bible. And if you want to honor someone, you're kind to that person, you're respectful of that person's dignity and their views, and you're ready to fulfill any reasonable request made of you. So respect is a big, big key. And it's certainly one that is important to marriage. Now, what are some of those qualities that might be the opposite of respect? that will help one to determine if they're showing the level of respect that's described in the Bible. Well, selfishness, that's one of them. And, uh, you know, it's easy to be selfish because it's kind of our makeup, we're thinking about ourselves. But it takes work to develop respect. And we do that by keeping an eye on the person with a personal interest. And that's what Philippians chapter 2, verse 4 tells us to keep an eye, not in uh, just on our own matters, but in the personal interest of others. And in this case, it would be our mates. So that helps. And uh, another one would be acknowledging differences in viewpoint. Now, the two of you have spent this time, you know, the whole idea behind courtship is for the two of you to get to know each other. You know, and you want to, um, you know, you want to have an idea that this is the person that I want to spend my life with. I want to be with this person throughout eternity. And uh, so, right now, I know you respect each other's viewpoint. Wait till you get married. <laughs> Because you're going to find out that you don't have identical views on everything. And uh, you may not even like the idea that, you know, the other person has. However, you, you may uh, at least, you know, respect that other person's point of view. Some of the things, Omar, that Jonathan likes, you might have a total, total different point of view. I know Jonathan loves the Raiders. <laughs> You may not even like it. You may not even like football. But you may respect the fact that this is something that he wants to do. You know, if that's something he wants to do, that's fine with me. Or whatever it is, whatever way the two of you might happen uh, to work it out. I'm certain there's something that Jonathan has discovered that you absolutely love, whatever it is that you might love to do. Maybe it's a certain type of, uh, you know, genre of... Um, motion picture or type of music that you like. And his viewpoint might be, well, I don't 
really care for that type of music. I don't care for that type of movie, but he respects the fact that it's something that is important to you. And so that's really what marriage is all about, acknowledging those differences and understanding that you know you may have to make the personal adjustment because it's something that is very important uh, to your mate. But when you're doing this, uh, you're applying exactly what we're describing here when it comes to respect in marriage. So you have it, you have the two keys that you uh, need. And those keys really open the door to other things in your marriage. You know, because if you have love and respect and you're imitating Jesus, then you want to imitate Jesus, uh, for example, Jonathan as the husband in headship. Now, it's rare that we just read the word headship in one of our publications. There's always a little adjective that's added to that, you know, that word or that expression headship. Because um, whenever you read about it, the adjective is what? Christ-like. It's not just headship. Um, you know, the inexperienced husband, I did it too, you enter the marriage thinking, I'm the head. <laughs> well, it doesn't quite work like that. What works is you are the Christ-like head. And uh, if you remember uh, some of the stories that we've read in our publications regarding Jesus, what was the outcome of everything that Jesus did in association with his disciples and people that uh, he taught and, and people that he healed? You, know, you look on the publications and the recipients of his uh, love, they're always smiling. Something good happened for them. They were amazed at the way that he did things. Wouldn't that be nice as a husband for your for Amara to be amazed at the, the way you imitate Jesus? Well, um, I don't know if amazement would amaze have two meanings, by the way. <laughs> but you want her to, you know, when she reads, you know, when she reads personally about Jesus, she wants to think, well, my husband would do exactly the same thing. And the nice thing about Jesus' example is uh, the wife is also able to develop the same qualities that Jesus demonstrated when he was here on the earth. So you want to develop those fine traits that uh, we read about in the Bible, manifesting Christ-like headship. He's not harsh. He's not dictatorial. He's not wrongly using his headship as a club to browbeat his wife, but instead he uses those two keys to love her and to show that he honors her with respect. There's another expression associated with Jesus, one that we know quite well, and Jesus was lowly in heart. And so uh, can you imagine, uh, Jonathan, what that might mean for you, lowly in heart and imitating Jesus. Unlike Jesus, of course, you're going to make your mistakes, but when you do, you certainly want Omar's understanding. So the humble husband is willing to say uh, two words. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and you're going to say that a lot because you're perfect. <laughs> One that you're going to say that will really strengthen your marriage, another expression that I think you must learn. Well, you were right. <laughs> and um, but, a, but a wife will find it much easier to respect the headship of a husband who is modest, who is humble, instead of one who is you know proud and stubborn. So in turn, uh, the respectful wife also apologizes when she is in error. So that's very very important. Now we also have what the Bible describes as subjection. Well, is subjection, that's a very strong word, you know, when you think about it. But again, oftentimes we read, you know, kind of a adjective um, associated with that, and it's having to do with wifely subjection. And that's something that's based on the Bible, and it's not just uh, a wife who submits to everything that her husband might say or do, but she's actively looking for a way to be a real helper, to really support 
her husband and the decisions that he makes and that's going to be a lot easier um, you know when she agrees with his decisions or even if she's not in agreement with uh, his decisions. sometimes you may have to support Jonathan and things that you know <laughs> it might not be good ideas but but I, I love you Mike see that you know this is something that is important to him and I'm going to support him no matter what the outcome is and that's something that the two of you will um, work out you also have an opportunity to express appreciation for his efforts in taking the lead instead of criticizing him or making him feel that he uh, you know they never satisfy uh, you know any request that you might have and you want to apply there's a couple of scriptures here that talks about the wife one is first Peter chapter 3 3 and 4 we find that with first Peter 3 3 and 4 and you can see how this applies oftentimes this is used to apply not just to the wife but to anyone but especially to our wives and to um, to sisters, but it talks about what is important, what Jehovah God sees. Do not let your adornment be external, the braiding of uh, hair and the wearing of gold ornaments or fine clothing, but let it be the secret person of the heart and the incorruptible adornment of a quiet and mild spirit, which is of great value in the eyes of God. So could you imagine Jehovah God looking in on your marriage and seeing the value of the hard work that the two of you put into making your marriage succeed. And it's really what we see in verse number four. This is what Jehovah God is looking at. The secret person of the heart. The person who manifests Christian qualities. Christ-like headship. Wifely subjection. And added to that is the quiet and mild spirit. That's what Jehovah God finds of great value and this is what you want to apply so if you're doing this and again you're using that key effectively that key opens the door for some wonderful opportunities to imitate the example of Jesus to demonstrate um, Christ-like headship to demonstrate wifely subjection now what is another thing that that key can be used that's motivated by love and it would have to do with uh, communication. Isn't communication very important? The likelihood is, during your courtship, um, it was easy to communicate with each other. It's been easy during this time, expressing views, talking to each other, you know, calling each other on the phone, enjoying each other's company. Well, there's no reason why that can't stop. Positive and open communication is very important, but there has to be a willingness on the part of the two of you to communicate because it is what? It is it works, it's something that works two ways. Well, what Bible counsel could be applied when it comes to communication? James chapter 1, verse 19. And uh, it clearly describes something that any one of us could apply. But here, what does the B part say? Everyone must be what? I don't let you have, you have it there. Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So, be willing to listen to the other person. Um, you might be interrupted at a time that you're busy doing something. And uh, you, you know, the, your first reaction might be, oh, I don't wanna hear that right now. But it might be important to the other person. So you wanna be quick to listen to the other person. Not so quick to necessarily respond to what they are saying because they may not necessarily need a response from you, but a listening ear. And uh, another area to remember when it comes to communication is that the way you communicate is important. Oftentimes you're gonna find that you both communicate and maybe you've seen this to some extent, you both communicate in different ways. Jonathan sometimes can be a man of few words, but his words are very important. Um, you, on the other hand, Omara, might be a person who is more communicative. There might be more the way you express yourself, but clearly, I'm certain the two of you have discovered that you communicate in different ways. 
as you understand that about each other, it certainly will be easier to communicate and to uh, enjoy each other's company. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 24 says, Pleasant sayings are sweet to the soul and a healing to the bones. And so this is a reminder of uh, the type of communication that's really going to strengthen a marriage. Pleasant sayings. And Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, Let your utterance be always with graciousness, seasoned with salt. In other words, communication that is in good taste. Well, that may not always be easy because, you know, emotions and personal points of views and other things can come into play. It really takes a lot of work to cultivate uh, the ability of being a good communi uh, a communicator within the framework of marriage. It takes work and it's ongoing. And uh, there are so many other factors that do come into play. But good communication flourishes when there are uh, gently spoken words, gracious looks and gestures, kindness, understanding, and tenderness. So just in hearing that said, obviously, you have to work hard in order to succeed or to have the opportunity to enjoy uh, success if you follow this counsel, if periodically you take out that key ring, you look at it and uh, make sure you have both keys on it, that the Bible principles are holding them together and you make an ongoing effort uh, to make it work for the two of you. Well, there's so much more that the Bible has to say in regard to succeeding in marriage and it's something that the two of you can spend time together uh, studying about, applying. You're very fortunate uh, as a couple, like so many young couples these days are, and older couples, but especially young, younger ones, in that there are so many resources that are available to them uh, that they can read together and work toward applying. And of course, we have the number one resource in all of the world, God's Word of Truth, the Bible, that we can certainly use to apply in our marriage. And when you do that, why, you'll have a very fine reputation and your marriage will be a fine example of others as they see the two of you working very, very hard to utilize the keys to a successful marriage. And look for ways to show love and respect for each other every day, set aside time on a regular basis to communicate with each other, really listen to each other, and uh, make it a habit to show kindness to each other. And as a reminder, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 4 through 8 says, love never fails. So, what do you say to that? 